All right, it is time for us to catch up on all the week's goings on. And we've got lots of uh, news makers as part of the show this morning and also lots of commentary on all the things that are happening. I'm uh, going to first welcome Canton Pele. It looks like you're in an exotic location, Canton. You've got sunglasses on at this time of the morning. That's not a bad Hi, sign. Hi, well, this, we got we got sunrise and um, well, the sun's just peeping over the horizon right now. And I'm facing it, as you can see in my glasses. So yeah. I don't want to get blinded by your dazzling presence, guys. <laughs> we like it. Good. A well-deserved holiday, I'm sure. So, yeah, uh, Pum- pretty much so. It Pum- was the last day of school for my seven-year-old yesterday, which means that I've only got 11 years to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Pumi and I are very excited to uh, have Canton back on the show this morning, but we're also excited to help have the new Deputy President of the ANC Youth League join us. After an eight-year-long leadership vacuum, the ANC Youth League has elected new leadership, the president, Colin Malachi, and the first woman deputy president, whose name is Pumzile Mpina. She is with us on the line now. Pumzile, how are you? Good morning, good morning. How are you? Good. Nice to see you and congratulations on your new post. Uh, how's the Youth League looking? Uh, <laughs> thank you very <laughs> much. It's looking very good, interesting. Um, I know that we've got a lot of challenges that we need to face right now as this leadership but at the moment everything is looking so good so uh, obviously you guys were in conference a a lot of people are saying well after eight years why bother they thought the anc youth league had disappeared Um, it had been disbanded at a certain time and many of the members of the then youth league obviously went to form the eff Um, so when it came to to getting people together and to try and revitalize this uh this this league um, how much work was going on for how long before you could even have these elections? Yeah, it's been a huge work that has been going on behind uh, the scenes because we need to remember that a lot of uh, provinces, branches, regions had not have a leadership in good standing. So EANC had to uh, appoint task teams to deal with that. And uh, those task teams took very long a time uh, to, to, to build those structures. So it has been a long journey uh, before we arrived to the uh, Congress, National Congress, as, still, as we're still continuing to build structures because some of the provinces still, they don't have leadership. Um, not sure the case at in Eastern Cape, as well as Gauteng. We are preparing that as that we must launch or must elect a leadership for those uh, provinces. So it's been a long journey. Uh, interesting though, because you remember some they were appointed and some they were disbanded, appointed, disbanded. So it's been a long journey. We appreciate that finally we do have been good standing. So what does it what does it mean to be deputy president of the ANC Youth League? Like what do you get for your job there? I mean, is is there a salary? Is there is there any kind of because I mean it sounds like a lot more work than it's worthwhile. I mean, is it worthwhile to be an ANC Youth League deputy president? In terms of, in terms of uh, salaries, we are not getting anything, but the gist is, uh, is to assist with the president, also to come up with programs that will revive young people. Uh, most especially in this time we are in, we are facing elections uh, of 2024. So as young people, most especially uh, this leadership is expected to be on the ground more than ever to make sure that we encourage young people to remember that the ANC is still the organization that uh, is in power and must continue to vote for it. And also coming up with uh, programs that will champion uh, their interests, most especially the issue of the unemployment, education, graduates that are at home, that are not working. We as young people we need to come up with interventions that how are we going to assist and make sure that uh, those challenges are faced and are championed accordingly. I know very well that it won't be easy for us to come up with uh, interventions now, but we are prepared to go on the ground and meet with those young people and come up with those uh, solutions. And at the same time, our solutions are very clear that we want to do away with the employment. So we need to come up with uh, very good strategies and um, a sustainable uh, mm-hmm. job opportunities we, uh, we want to uh, intervene with to assist our young people. So as a deputy president, also responsible for international politics. So it's a lot of work, very interesting, because we'll be understanding uh, the work that around our our, 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 our our continent, as well as the other countries, that how are they doing? How are they uh, uh, 
are keeping up with their youth structures so that they can set to account be able to align ourselves with them. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge task, but I'm prepared for it and also looking forward to learn more on it. I know Pumi and Canton have got some questions for you. Just a remark, I'm pleased that youth unemployment is at the top of your agenda because obviously that's the biggest issue, I think, facing young people in South Africa. And it's interesting that your portfolio includes international politics. I didn't know that. Uh, Canton, you've got some things to ask. Well, the first question is, Pumsila, do you get a blue light brigade? And the second question is, uh, uh, tell us a bit about your background, the, the journey that got you into where you are right now. What was your academic background that got you there? What was your political education background that got you there? I think uh, it'd be certainly useful for me to have a sense of of the journey that yeah. you had, and I'm sure that everyone else would like that as well. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm from uh, Newcastle. Uh, it's Basul Natal, the small town for Newcastle, the, the, the region. It's in Busogbega. The district is Amajuba district. Um, I studied uh, the public management um, at Amajuba, Civet College here within the, the around the district. I also worked at a uh, local municipality, Office of uh, I also uh, worked at, uh, as a, I was deployed actually as the speaker. I was a counselor, then I was deployed as a speaker at Amatuba District Municipality. In terms of leadership, I've been living at the ground level, at the branch level, as the branch chairperson. I also led as the REC, of which is the regional structure of the ANC League. I also led uh, as um, a, a Deputy Secretary of the ANC. You remember that in this eight years whereby the ANC was not the uh, it was not in, 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 in their structures had challenges. So I had to lead ANC because I couldn't just do anything, but I went to lead ANC trying to revive or trying to build the ANC. But at that time, I was sitting in ANC. So I led as the deputy secretary of the, of the region, I also led as a deputy chair of the ANC in the region. But recently, I was appointed to be a task team of the provincial. Um, this was a PCPC, which is a provincial preparatory a, a committee a, that we're preparing for a congress of the, the province of KwaZulu Natal. So I've been, uh, uh, okay, before I was elected as DPC president, I was leading at the provincial level of the ANC Youth League, assisting to build the, the structures of the ANC Youth League. So that's, that's, that's where I am. But uh, when I was in Mons Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but you know it's always been an issue in the ANC Youth League that like there are fifty-year-olds who are claiming to be youths. So we we need to know, um, and it's a rude question to ask a woman, but how old are you, and how old is the president, Colin Malachi? Malachi is thirty years, and my I was born in nineteen ninety. Um, this is turning thirty-three on August. All right, that's that still classifies, if you ask me. I mean, what do you think, Pumi? Is that too old for youth league? Yeah, I think it's a bit old. <laughs> I do, because at 30 years old, you know, young people, in my view, young people are 16, 17, 18, maybe even 25. But by the time you're 30 years old, you you know, you, you have a little bit of, um, you should have a little bit of education, you should have a little bit of uh time under your belt in a workplace, in a work environment. And the expectation is to be making decisions. I mean, if I think about, because we um, work with all sorts of different people from all over the world, when I think about the 30-year-olds or 32-year-olds that I meet in other political environments, you know, the, their level of education, their level of experience, they don't consider themselves youth. And I mean, I think my most pressing question really is after eight years of not having the structure, have, why haven't you realized that the structure doesn't matter? It doesn't matter within this organization and just fold it up and move on. You know, why, what is it that was missing in the past eight years that you felt you needed to revive the structure? No, the structure was, uh, it was needed to be, to be, to be, to, to be, to come back. We needed the structure. Young people has uh, suffered a lot because 
the absence, the absenteeism of the ANC. Like that's why we had to push to the ANC that we really need the the voice of people to come back. You'll understand that uh, we had faced with a COVID nineteen of which it took almost two years. I think it's also one of the things that delayed us to to, to launch the structures. But there are a lot of challenges within the ANC that we need to fix first before we go out and launch the the, the ANC. Like. Um, then we come back with the ANC like after eight years. After eight years, you realize that uh, there was a fees must fall, of which was led by people, by young people of South Africa. Uh, then the ANC clip was not there. Uh, we've got a lot of problems that were going on, whereby we're not, we're not, we're not um, led by young, by, by young structures. But what formal- has been achieved? So what has been achieved? Prior, in the eight years, I understand the eight years is gone. Uh, before that, what has the Youth League achieved that you felt you needed to revive it and it had, can achieve this? Well, come so if I, I think mean, about the, the, the Youth League, league of Mbalula, if I think of the Youth birth. League of Tikaba, <laughs> if I think yeah. of... No, I'm serious. I mean, if we go all the way back and talk about the Youth League of Nelson Mandela, that's a different story. I'm just saying in the past 30 years, okay? What the Youth is League gave the youth birth league to the EFF. Achieved? It gave birth to the EFF. Surely that's a significant achievement, Pumi. No, it's not. But anyway, but I, I'd really like to hear. Pum, I'd really like to hear Pumzile's view on on what those achievements are. You talk about fees must fall. There are still university fees. There are still many kids who are being excluded, financially excluded. So that hasn't achieved anything. Yeah, we understand that there's a lot that as, as young people that we need to do that has not maybe been seen as if has been, we, we, we as a youth league has achieved. But there are a lot of things already we think done as the ANC youth league, previous youth league for the past eight years, people, if you're not counting the eight years. But what I'm saying right now is that for the past eight years, we're not, we don't want to go back and um, start to, to, to raise things that um are not uh, uh, that has not been done but now we are prepared to start to work for young people and to work with young people we will understand that we click has been talking about the economic uh, freedom in our lifetime all those things gender equality all we are we are prepared to start to to move forward from there you will see that uh, most of young people uh, they're in business they we want to we want to make sure that those who are in business they they benefit they work they 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 they, 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 they when when they they, they go to what? their business if Who are these think. most young people yeah. that are in business when we sit here today with a 65% dropout rate? Only 30, 30 odd people who start grade one finish matric. So who are these young people that are in business? 65% yeah, uh, dropout rate. Yes, we understand. Even the issue of unemployment is very high. It's good. It's very high. We understand. A lot of people are not working, some are working, but as young people, what we are saying is that we want to go back and understand that what's going on, what causes a lot of young people to drop out. The issue of policies, we need to zoom in our policies, we need to see what we can do with our policies, because we do understand the government that needs to be uh, implemented, but as young people, we need to zoom into those policies that are they assisting young people enough in our country because we see uh, even the the, the, the the education system that we are we are in some they 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 graduate but they can't get work some they start their businesses but they fail so I think we need to look into our policy what are, what, what are those challenges some of the things that we've been looking going with as uh, that we've been going through as young people that those policies are there but they're not assisting young people the policy of education uh, does it speak to our social ills that uh, we are facing as a country? Because we believe that whatever we are studying must come, whatever we are studying, when we are done, we must be able to assist in the society that we are coming in. But now we realize that those uh, policies or those, the, the education system that we are having does not respond to our challenges that we are facing in the society. Each of businesses is always saying that we do have people who are in business, but they are struggling because we had They've been complaining to us, but also the issue of fundings that we see on the on the budgets on the departments that uh, are this allocated for young people, but still they're failing to access those fundings. As young people, we are saying we want to review those policies. We want, we want Sorry, to, I just want to. Those, I just want to interrupt uh, for, for a second. I mean, I, I think it's I think it's kind of um, it's maybe a little unfair of us to be asking you to to explain everything when you've just taken this job on. 
what I'd like to know from you, and there's obviously a reason that people elected you as deputy president, and there's obviously something about you that that has inspired some leadership within the the ANC Youth League, and I want to know what your your ambitions are for the ANC Youth League. What would you like to see the ANC Youth League achieve in the next year or two? What are the are the actual goals that you have in mind that that you would like to bring forward as as deputy president? Um, Gareth, if I could just add to uh, what you've just asked, Pumzile, I'd also like to get a sense of to what extent the Youth League is actually able to make input into actual ANC policy. I don't know right now whether the Youth League just simply measures decisions that get taken at the level of the NEC or whether you actually have the opportunity to put forward new policy and say to the ANC proper, here's what, uh, here's the direction we think that you should be going. And I'd like a sense of to what extent you can actually put that in. For example, would you be able to say, get rid of a minimum wage for the for the youth so that all of them can get jobs? Go ahead. No, th no thank you very much. Um, there are a lot of things that we want to see changing, most especially as young people of the of, of South Africa, because when we are leading at the national level, we are no longer leading now uh, the certain provinces, but we are leading everyone in the country. We want to see uh, young people um, in being involved in our economy uh, in all ways, uh, in all sectors. Young people must be involved. And we, we want to see our young people enjoying the, the benefits of uh, being uh, South Africans, because some of some most of the time they, you find yourself that you're from South Africa, but you can't, you know, access or get uh, bursaries, get fundings, get everything uh, that uh, you you need to do. You need to have in order to 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 change your life. So we want to see our young people uh, very, being uh, involved in economy in, of our country by uh, being uh, in businesses, being mining sector, in farming, agriculture. We want to see them working. They want. We want actually as young people who want to create a sustainable, a sustainable uh, jobs for young our, for for our young people in the country. Secondly, we also want to see uh, the, econ the, the the educational system of our country uh, changes to, to 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 accommodate our people to accommodate our young people. Talking about the the, the educational system, uh, I'm, I'm from grade one to grade twelve. We want, we want to start to focus there because most of the time. We focus on the teacher institution, but forgetting about the basic education, because I believe that the most important uh, phase for our people, or for our youth, and we also want to focus on the youth, the the the, the teenage pregnancy, because you find that you click, okay, basically, Gareth, you join ANC you click when you are fourteen to thirty five, but most of the time, as Upume was saying, uh, that. Uh, 32 and uh, 38 only focus on the on the issues of employment, edu higher education, etc. But this, as this youth league, we want to also focus on youth that are in high school, uh, the 14 year, that those who are dropping out because most of the dropouts we find them that they leave school at the at maybe when they're doing grade five, I mean grade 10, 11, 12, they just grow up from there. So as this youth league, we want to go in and zoom in on the basic education that what's wrong, what causes the, the dropouts uh, on, on that level. But we also want to assist our government to come up with um, strategies that how are we going to keep them at school so that if we can change the educational system, maybe they can be in school, they can be interested to continue studying at school and to avoid uh, the, 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 the dropouts that we, we are seeing. Also, I want to focus on the, on the, on the youth that uh, it's looming on the on the streets, uh, that domain known like Onya Upe Amapara. <clears throat> As young people, we want to zoom in, we want to intervene on those ones. How are we going to assist them? How are we going to build more rehabs that they must be assisted? And when they, get to, when, they, when they get to those rehabs, they must get skills that when they, they go out, they can live their life, they can live through those skills that they get from the rehab. So we want to do a lot of things to assist young people. We don't want to focus on, on, on one set of young people, but we want to cover all young people of South Africa, as I was saying, starting from high school, starting from the 14th year, because the issue of teen pregnancy, it's also our duty to make sure that we go and, 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 and teach those young people that how it's important to, 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 to protect yourself 
Uh, there are a lot of things that we need to do. So as you are saying, Gerard, we are about, we we we, are, we just arrived in the office, but already we've got things that we want to see mm-hmm. happening. Lives and and Kenton's, and Kenton's question about how much influence you actually have on the ANC and policy making. Yes, we do have an influence because the president and the SG of the ANC could be sitting on the NEC of the ANC. So uh, everything that we 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 are uh, uh, agreeing on or on the on the on the uh, on the NEC, they will be able to sit on those committees of the of the ANC, of which uh, it's a, it's an NEC. They sit on the NWC. They sit on the deployment committees. So they will be sitting there as young people representing us president and SG. So we do have influence. And also, the ANC uh, is one of the, the, the organization that listens to uh, their people, most especially young people, because we understand that the future of, of the organization lies with young people. So the, the leadership that we are having right now is very um, listening. It's very patient with us. So whatever that we want to we want, we want to raise, they'll be able to speak to us, even if it's not in the meeting properly. But uh, whenever we want to we want to engage them, uh, they'll be able to listen to us. So we do have influence as young people right. of our uh, ANC. All right, we, we've got time for one or two more questions. I, I do want to let Pumi and Canton have a go here because uh, I've taken up most of your time. I, I have a very significant question, uh, Pumzila. Do you use ChatGPT? <laughs> Sorry? Do you use ChatGPT, artificial intelligence, or any of the other uh, AI tools that are now on the market? No. Okay. The, you see, the reason why I ask the question is because a lot of the established wisdom in terms of how the youth will be getting employment over the next um, decade or so has been turned upside down by artificial intelligence. And any policy that goes forward is going to have to take into account the fact that the entire employment framework that the forthcoming generation is going to deal with is going to be completely turned upside down. And I think that any policy formulation in terms of how the education system goes that doesn't take that into account is actually going to be obsolete to a large extent. So, you know, the reason for asking that question is, you know, to what extent there are discussions already within the ranks of the ANC Youth League around what's happening in artificial intelligence and the developments that it's going to be taking in the job market and uh, and so forth. So let me toss that in your direction. You know, I... I, I think that th- that question, Kenton, I think that's an it's an interesting question, but you know I, I would ask for what. But um, I'm very interested to hear, and this is probably a little speculative, uh, Pumzile, for you. What do you think? So I hear what you 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 as the youth league or you in your position in the youth league would like to do or to see. But what do you think young people on that on their side need to do to change their circumstances? What do you think as a person who's not a member of the youth league, as a young person who's going to vote next year, or maybe is just still at school, what do you think they need to do in order to change their circumstances? For themselves. Mm. I think um as young people. We need to we need to take ourselves serious firstly. We need to understand what do we want and how are we going to be assisted. If you if you come to government, we need to know how 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 government must must assist us or must meet us halfway. I'm saying this because most of the time when you're having meetings with young people and then they will say, we are not working, uh, they will raise a lot of um, uh, uh, challenges. Then you ask them that how are we going to assist you well, how are you? Ex- how, how, like the question that like you're asking, what what must we do as government that to assist you? I'll, I'm saying this because I, I I was a speaker of the council. So the speaker part of the the, the, the duties is to interact with stakeholders, uh, uh, especially young people, all of those government. Um, sorry, all those um, uh, NGOs, NPOs that are there. So when you're having meetings with them, you will ask them, how are you? How are we going to assist you? Some of them they're clueless. You know, anything that you can give us, like anything. But what I'm saying right now, 
the only thing that will be able to assist them meeting government how it, meeting government halfway is for them to understand what do they want how are we going to assist them okay maybe they will say we want to start businesses but what kind of businesses you know how that business is going to assist you assist the society assist uh, uh, even assist others that are around you right. that are uh, but from, I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you what i'll tell you what we we're going to have to cut this short but i really appreciate your time this morning because i know that you've just been elected and i didn't want to uh, to hit you with a barrage of very very complex stuff right in the first week of your of your deputy presidency but i hope you'll come and visit us again and maybe we can have a longer conversation about this once you've been in the job a bit longer uh good luck what can we say good luck oh, thank you very much thank you thank you Pumzile Mkina, who is now the deputy president of the anc youth league which has been defunct for eight years and they're back in the game and uh, they're ready uh, to get in and make a contribution and in some way involve themselves before the election, I'm sure. Right, Pumi? Right, Canton? I mean, that's the important, uh, <laughs> that's the reason, that's the reason they're around. I, th I think the most significant platform that the ANC Youth League could be adopting right now, to your point earlier, Pumi, is they should actually be pushing for a quota of MPs that are based on people being significantly younger than mm -hmm. the career politicians that we have right now. But, you know, that's just my take on it. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, we've got uh, the majority of this uh, this show now for the rest of this uh, hour. We've got about half an what hour. What are yet. we watching? What, what, what's the, what, what are the, the big things that we're watching? Last well, week I was in a, in a Russia rabbit hole. I'm sure Canton has many things to say about that. Yeah, I I do, I do want to hear from Canton because he missed out on, on telling us about his thoughts on the, the, the Wagner group and what happened there. We've got to get into that. But I first and foremost want to talk to you guys about France because what's going on in France now, I think, is an indication of what may happen in other European countries and which has been really and it's been bubbling under for a very long time. And essentially, to give everybody a little bit of perspective here, the story is that a young Algerian man was uh, pulled over by the police. He did not comply with that uh, imminent arrest. He drove away. He tried to, uh, to drive past. Some people said he tried to drive over a police officer. He didn't. In fact, there's camera footage that shows he was disobeying their order to um, avail himself for, for an arrest. Um, he'd apparently had serious convictions beforehand, had also avoided arrest beforehand. So not exactly a, a stunning member of society, this. But France has got this interesting problem because there are so many immigrants from Algeria, Morocco, um, other parts of North Africa, Tunisia. Of course, there are lots of people from Syria that are now in France and various other uh, nations all over the world that have come to France because their own nations are a disaster. And then they found themselves as part of uh, an ethnic minority within France, uh, an increasing ethnic minority. The question here is, um, when this guy was shot by the police, the police officers said it was by mistake. Um, there are a whole lot of conjectural stories that have come out of that. But essentially what's happened in the wake of that is nothing short of what happened with George Floyd in America, where suddenly it turned into an issue of, oh, the police hate our specific race. The police hate us as immigrants or as a minor minority. And we're now going to loot stores and steal TVs. Um, they've also burnt cars. They've torched public buildings. The French president has estimated the damage already to be well over a billion dollars. And he's having a very, very difficult time trying to bring things back to order. And this is not uh, something which is going to be easy to solve for Europe because Europe's had this uh, guilt complex for a little while about their former colonies, for right or for wrong. And now they're trying to deal with it. What do you think is going to happen here? And Canton and Pumi, do you have anything to add to my <laughs> rough and very unwieldy summary of what went on? It's a reasonably accurate summary that you've given there, Gareth. The The guy was 17 years old, so that's a, a, a significant point as well. You know, you're 17 years old, but, you know, you, you're you driving a car. You're obviously unlicensed. You've uh, th There's a range of stuff. But, you know, does well, we that mean... We were just talking about the youth, so yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but does that mean that uh, he should be shot in the face um, by a police officer just simply because he's trying to drive away? I think that, right. you know, the concept of... Uh, unreasonable force out there uh, is probably at the <laughs> forefront. Something we have to understand about the French is that what the French do is they riot. You know, yeah. the, this is a, this is something that's an intrinsic part yeah. of their culture. 
Yes, and there was a uh, meme. There was a meme on the internet yesterday. It was like the French. These are very often first generation immigrants. <laughs> are we really talking about the French? I mean, I know about the revolution and all the revolutions subsequent to that. And you're right about the French. But there's a difference here between the kinds of protests where Batmans are jumping out of vehicles and all standing there with signs and people looting, destroying and breaking down public infrastructure. OK, well, let, let's just drill down into, the, into the, the immigrant question, because I think the immigrant question is actually significant. But one of the things that we need to take into account, so figures that I've seen bandied around, is that, in fact, only about 10 percent of the current people who are rioting happen to be first generation immigrants. Because you consider up until round right about the time that I was born, Algeria was actually part of France. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the people who actually grew up over the past um, 50, 60 years in, 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 uh, in France, they're, they're, they're actually as French as uh, all of the uh, people of a paler hue. The only language that they know is, uh, is French. The only um, background that they have is being kind of immersed in, in French culture. What is mm -hmm. true is that you've had this injection of a very strongly Islamist element over the very recent past that has actually brought a very strong influence to bear in terms of the current direction in terms of the uh, the politics uh, of France. So it is that element really that very systematically did specific things that to my mind are dangerous. The specific things is they targeted police stations and why did they target the police stations? Because they wanted to raid firearms. Now that for me is a big red flag. And <clears throat> that's an indication that there's this undercurrent of society that is actually steering the riots in a particular direction. And that, uh, to my mind, is actually going to lead to Macron being toppled sooner rather than later. Very clearly, uh, uh, from my perspective, what's going to happen is that Marine Le Pen is going to be very strongly uh, boosted as a direct result of this. And I, I think that we're very likely to see the possibility of her actually taking over the presidency come the next mm -hmm. election. But again, this is not something that's unique to France, guys. If you look in terms of German politics right now, and if you Sweden. look in terms of, uh, yeah, Sweden's another good example. So th there's a, a rise of strongly nationalist parties that are taking place. Really? Um, Hungary. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, I, I think, you know, France is, is kind of um, the most visible manifestation of the stuff that's going on right now. But wow. um, I, I think it's, uh, it's a strong current that's being pushed throughout um, the rest of, uh, of Europe. And, you know, frankly, they, they are paying the price for basically trying to boost their economies by importing cheap labor from, uh, you know, countries that fundamentally don't share uh, the values of liberté, égalité, fraternité that the, the French are famous for. Poops, so, <laughs> <Pumps>, yeah. <laughs> you know, what has been interesting for me to watch over the past couple of days is the reporting around these particular riots. And as Canton says, you know, the French riot. <laughs> there were riots last year in Paris. There were riots the year before that. In fact, the only time, even if you, if you, if you do a quick wiki uh, media kind of list of riots in France, the only time there were no riots is literally the time there were COVID lockdowns. Every single year before that, there were riots in France, you know. And, but, but, you know, just talking about the rise of these kind of very strong nationalist movements, the reporting on this has then been so skewed towards saying that the reason all of these riots are happening is because there are all these people who are not French, who, who don't share our values, who've come into this country and they are unruly. They haven't been, you know, it's that's very not, similar to the not kind in, of... Is there not some truth to that or is it all made up nonsense? But if you listen to the fact that the people who are rioting, only a small percentage of those people are actually immigrants. 
then it's not true that the people that are causing the riots that are burning down things are all foreigners who don't believe in French values. If you look at the history of France... I couldn't agree with you more on that. French values include <laughs> like rioting and misbehaving in the streets. Absolutely. I just want you to watch this quickly. This is, this is Douglas Murray, who's been a guest on this show before. He's increasingly outspoken to the point where, I mean, now he just doesn't hold back at all. And, and really, I think he says a few things in here which are going to definitely raise some hackles. I think he was on Piers Morgan, but listen to this. Well, it's, it's a kind of grievance competition. Your guest earlier just tried to engage in it. I don't know what hurt she believes she's had from slavery. Uh, all of this was addressed two centuries ago. Everything has consequences. All history has consequences and ramifications. But, you know, if we were to play this fairly, we would at least look at all of the countries around the world that engaged in the slave trade who are simply not interested in any form of reparations, the, the, the Ottoman Empire, all the Arab countries who not just traded far more slaves than across the Atlantic, but castrated all the men so that there wouldn't be any more African slaves in, uh, after them. They worked them to the bone. I see no interest across Africa in paying reparations for selling their brother and sister Africans into slavery or for working them to the bone to the present day. There is slavery across Africa today. In fact, there are more slaves in the world today than there were at the height of the transatlantic slave trade. So some of us are simply a bit bored of hearing people ripping at closed wounds and then crying about their hurt or their presumed hurt because everybody could do this. A million Europeans were stolen by North Africans over the course of decades of the North African Barbary pirate slave trade. Where would you end if you did that? The answer is you couldn't end because nobody is alive who has actually suffered the hurt and nobody is alive who did the wrong. And I'd make one other point, if I may. It's always the countries that people want to come to who are put through this struggle session. Britain, like America and France, are among the, are the most desired destinations for migrants worldwide and have been for centuries. Why is that? It's not because we're racist. It's because we're better. It's because we're good. It's because when we see racism, we actually call it out and recognize it as a sin. Try finding that across Africa. Try finding that across the Middle East or in China. Nobody would hear. So what we have is a situation where the more virtuous countries are presented as the worst countries. It's sick and most of us are tired of it. I don't know whether you agree with all or some of that. But no, that it's, a, it, it, it's, it's a hideously skew, a skewed perspective, Gareth. I mean, let, I, let's consider, for example... I, I mean, the, the only reason I said that there is yeah. because of his, his comment at the end about emigration and immigration. If these countries, even if it was only a small percentage of, of immigrants who were, who were complaining here in, in, in France, maybe justifiably about this one death, but it seems to me like this immigration-emigration conversation has to be ended at some point. The people who are moving to countries rather than the people who are running away from countries, we need to, to figure out in our minds why they're leaving the countries of their birth in the first place, why they would want to go to some terrible place like France instead of staying in Algeria. Well, the fact is that if you look in terms of the immigrants that have been pouring into Europe over the past decade, it's because of the fact that the West has been bombing the shit out of Syria and created that absolute crisis out there that caused people to flee the country. The current um, crop of immigrants that are flooding into Europe are millions of Ukrainians. And again, you know why has this come about? It's because NATO basically triggered a war in Ukraine by, by saying to the Russians, we're going to let Ukraine into NATO. The Russians said that's a red line, we're going to attack, and Biden gives them a middle finger. The Russians then attack. And Biden says to Ukraine, oh, sorry, guys, you're not going to join NATO until you actually beat Russia, which means that they're never going to join NATO. There's this entire process over the course of history where you destabilize countries in the third world, forcing a sense of abject poverty, and then say, we are better. Why are you better, Britain? You're better because you stole literally trillions of dollars from India and from China 100 years ago. Those were the top economies in the world at the time. You toppled those economies. You created the humanitarian crisis in that part of the world. So and then, when, yes, and then and you deserve it. So, you know, but and at the same say, time, consider the hypocrisy of the fact that you will allow people to come in in boatloads as cheap labor. 
But, you know, any one of us as South Africans, we try applying for a Schengen visa to get into those countries legally, just to go in on a holiday. My word, Mm -hmm. they put us through the friggin' ringer. So there's a fundamental level of duplicity in the stuff that these guys think. I think that uh, that people who've been fleeing South Africa to go to the UK, for example, have very quickly turned tail and come back because they they can't afford (laughs) the basics. Whole Facebook groups, whole Facebook (laughs) groups, full of them complaining. But But you know what is also quite, frankly, quite boring about not just the delivery of of all of that rhetoric, it's also the fact that it is so completely generalized generalized and tries to make everybody complicit we are all bored of it he says <laughs> you know we, we and and i'm just saying they are they they it's so simplified and so um bland but the way in which he delivers it right is is emphatic and he knows all of the facts and he is so right and everybody is on his side and he is the mouthpiece for everybody that's utter bullshit i think every single one of those pieces of things Mm -hmm. that he wants to talk about can be broken down and have a calm conversation about any one of those things right so if we want to talk about immigrants if we want to talk about why the world is unstable if we want to talk about why other countries are completely poor and other countries are you know we're just talking about france one of the things that everybody is talking about is how much gold they have in their reserves without a single gold mine (laughs) in France, right? All of those things are are all interconnected. So, of course, you can go a thousand years back. Using it to to regild the roof of the Palace of Versailles as we speak. I kid you not. (laughs) Um, Look, Gareth, I've got to say... A thousand years back and say the Ottomans this and the the Greeks that. Of course you can. We were also in the last hour just talking about how close long ago actually is mm-hmm. you know when yeah. when you, when i talk about the fact that my great grandmother was born in 1900 that's even before there was an anc those kinds of things you know when you when you then have a microphone and nobody else is saying anything and nobody and and you are saying it so confidently and emphatically that it's it's so mm-hmm. long ago we've got to, we're better than everybody else such bullshit I've got uh, guys right. here, here, Gareth. Here's something that I'm going to toss in your direction. Okay, no. who is the only U.S. president who is not descended from slave owners? Donald Trump. Absolutely, because Does even he Obama is in? even Obama <laughs> is descended from slave owners on his mother's yeah. side. Exactly. So you know. So so, so my the, my entire point around you know where do you start? in terms of of reparations because you know if you're going to trace ancestry of um, uh, most uh, black uh, americans you're going to find that i would say the overwhelming majority of them actually have uh, slave ancestry as well okay so, so what what becomes the means <laughs> test that you apply for reparations no, the, so okay. at that level i agree good. reparations is stupid good. It's a good general discussion but we must also talk about a couple of other things i wanted to get to the U.S. Supreme Court striking down affirmative action because that obviously has implications across America. And what they were talking about there was particularly college admissions. Of course, Asian American students being horribly um, marginalized by these tertiary education institutions. They have to score an unbelievable number of points. The kind of, uh, you know, the the odds of them getting into a Harvard, a Yale, a Columbia, a Stanford are absolutely impossible. It means they have to be in the top 002% of all students and they have to score 100 out of 100 in order to get in there. And the standards are much lower for other people, including whites and blacks. So they've, they've taken Harvard to, to court. The Supreme Court has ruled that affirmative action needs to come to an end. It's a bad policy. It prejudices people. There needs to be merit applied in these things. And I mean, we could talk about that in the South African context. But if you can keep your comments short on that, we'll still have time for Russia. So go ahead, both of you. Canton, you're on mute. You wasted a whole second. <laughs> I've got I've got some background experience here because remember, you know, more than three decades ago, I was uh, a student at Princeton, and at the time, all of us who got in at Princeton, we got in firstly on the basis of academic merit. 
So you had to tick particular boxes first as part of the selection process. I didn't know all of this stuff at the time. So I didn't know that, you know, getting um, an almost perfect score on the SATs, for example, was something that was of significance. But, you know, I, when I got to Princeton, the one thing that you knew is that everyone who was there had actually scored in the 90th percentile on uh, on the scholastic aptitude test. And that was the entry point for you to get in. Then once you got in, they then assessed your ability to be able to pay. And, you know, based on the fact that I came from uh, South Africa, the RAND was uh, pretty much useless. I didn't have anyone uh, supporting me. I got in on a 100% scholarship. And so it, it was, it's a means-based uh, test. And what has been true, I, I still donate money to Princeton every year. And the reason why I do it is because the majority of the students that get into Princeton are in some form of financial assistance in order to get into the place. The problem that the Supreme Court has struck down is that that merit-based system was systematically undermined in terms of actually favoring African Americans, but not on the basis of merit. So you would allow African Americans to get into your Ivy League universities with, let's say, a a 50% uh, average rather than a a 99% average for Asian Americans, which is stupid at two levels. Okay, the one is it's uh, making the assumption that. Uh, Black people are not smart enough to get in on, on merit. No, absolutely, they are, because there were a massive number of incredibly bright um, uh, African Americans who were my classmates at the time, and they've gone on to do absolutely amazing things uh, mm. in the American context. But what the Ivy Leagues have been doing is deliberately dumbing <clears throat> down the admissions for African Americans. And guess what? The majority of them actually don't complete university. So it, it's it's first year virtue signaling that actually blocks out um, the ability of people to get in entirely on merit. So I think it was a good decision. Pumi, what do you think? I don't have an opinion simply because I don't know enough about the American sense of affirmative action. But in a general context, myself included, being one of the people who benefited from affirmative action in this country in various places. They are, so, and, and similar to the colonialism and slavery conversation, there are so many different nuances that, uh, that have to be taken into account when you think about affirmative action. I think it is silly to think that affirmative action is about lowering standards. You know, when I consider the fact that when I got my scholarship to get into the German school, I got there because of my academic ability. And to this day, one of the, the enduring memories is having a conversation in then Standard 9 with a, a one of the German students who couldn't understand why all the black kids were always getting marks better than his. And when I said to him, that's because they're all here because they're smart and you're here because you speak German. <laughs> it, 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 for him, the, even just that understanding, because that's, that's what it is. And what you're looking at is you're saying, if in a country where eight out of 10 people are black and there are lots of capable uh, available black people who have not been allowed into these spaces. How do we create an opportunity to get more but, black people going forward into now, spaces? You have yeah, to. You have to start somewhere. Right now, you have to start right somewhere. Now, there, are, there are no spaces where black people are not allowed in South Africa in 2023, and in America in 2023, True. there are no spaces black people are not allowed. So that argument kind of flounders. Plus. No. The fact that no, we're arguing no. in this country from a majority point of view for affirmative action Garrett, and in America they're arguing it from a minority point of view means they Garrett, invalidate each other. What, what you missed is that you had to start somewhere. You had mm. to start somewhere. And if there is a need to re recalibrate and reshape, if there is a need to recalibrate and reshape, then do that. Mm. 
But I think to Pumi, have you read the Supreme Court judgment? No, I haven't. Have That's why I'm saying no, I don't no, have no, an no, opinion. No, 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 no. I'm saying so. What I'm <clears throat> saying is, start off with that because everything that I've told you so far is based on the fact that I've actually read through the judgments. Yeah, I've but read, that's why I've, I start I've off by saying I don't have a comment on okay. what they are doing because I don't have the information. Your experience that you described, in fact, mirrors my experience because you got in on merit. I got into Princeton on merit. I didn't get in because my grades were lower than anyone else. Well, and I'm saying that over the past um, more than three decades since I got into Princeton, there has been a deliberate dumbing down of the standards for admission in order to artificially boost the numbers of African Americans getting into the Ivy League schools, most and, likely by by, yeah. by left wing white people who are trying to just look like they're doing the right thing instead of actually doing things Absolutely. to help. Absolutely, Absolutely. Look, guys, and yes. it, it, the thing about it is that, it, like everything in time and history, it's a continuum, and it's important right. to continually um, recalibrate for the I, environment that you are in. I just want to like put a put a break on this quickly. I mean. You, you, neither of you ever have to explain that you're anywhere on merit. Part of the reason we love having you on the show is because there's no doubt that the both of you have that kind of merit and that no doubt the institutions which you were educated at saw that long before we did and we get to benefit from it today. What I will say is that Russia is a big bugbear. People are saying that you're pro-Russia, uh, Canton. So I want you to just address this before we close <laughs> off for today. And I know Pumi's got, uh, she's up to here with the Wagner group. But what do you have to say about that uh, coup that was attempted, that everybody went crazy about, that ended up being a damp squib? What do you have to say about Prigozhin? What do you have to say about what the Wagner group may continue to do in Africa? Because that's right here. Look, guys, uh if I'm going to try to explain in 20 seconds what I spent, you know, several hundred words explaining on my website, I'm not going to do justice to it. The, the question in terms of what happens with Wagner is highly nuanced. On my website, on kantanpalay.com, it's the top story. It's been sitting there for a week. I go into great detail around what I think exactly went down out there. The question of whether or not I'm pro-Russian, cheese, guys, you know, what does that mean? You know, I'm not pro-Russian. I happen to be. I happen to be anti-NATO. I happen to be anti-NATO. Can we just get real? This is not a defensive organization. This is an organization that has been deliberately provoking regime change around the world. And right now, in terms of what happens in the Ukrainian conflict, it's very mm. clear to me that this was entirely triggered by Joe Biden. And it's also very clear to me that if Donald Trump had been president, this conflict would not have happened. That does not make me pro-Russia, guys. Let's get real. Oh, by the way, guys, you know, I've, I've got to interrupt for a second because there's a whole crowd of Niala that are walking past right now. Okay, let's have a look. Here we go. Let's put this on the screen. That's beautiful. Look at that. Now, that is the kind of audience we want for the burning platform. I like it. <laughs> Hey, um, in deepest Africa. So, so Canton is so basically anybody who's watching this show this morning. There's Canton who's been accused of being pro-Russian. There's Pumi who's always accused by various people in the comments section of either being pro-ANC, anti-DA, anti-EFF. God alone knows what you haven't been called, Pumi. There's me who was given shit this morning for even giving the ANC Youth League deputy president a chance to speak. So. Um, Clearly, this is where you come for <laughs> equal opportunity haters. <laughs> yeah, equal opportunity come. haters. No. Guys, I've got to point out, okay, the fact that I believe that Russia is going to win this conflict in Ukraine does not make me pro Russian. It's stating a fact. You know, can we? It's just okay to get... be pro Russian, can then? It's okay to no, be pro Russian. No, but the, uh, okay. you're drawing a false we will love inference. You anyway. No, it's a we false will... inference, uh -oh. Pumi. The fact that I say, you will... okay, my friend that... who loves Russia is still my friend. The 800 pound gorilla is going to blixum the seven year old girl. That's what's happening in Ukraine right now. This is not saying that I'm pro Russian. It's pointing out that it's freaking obvious that the right. 800 pound gorilla <laughs> blixums. Uh, this, is why, this is why we love the burning platform. It's why I love uh, when all three of us are on and we actually have time to talk <laughs> instead of having just yet. We'll have to do this again in another week's time or in two weeks' time whenever Canton's available again. Pumi and I will be back next Thursday and we've got lots of stuff still to cover. So thank you. Thank you to our guests this morning and most especially thank you to you for listening. Cheers. We're going to go. Is that, Canton, you look like you wanted to say something. <laughs> no, we don't Gareth, know because behind Gareth, those dark seriously, glasses... I, 
Okay, <laughs> guys, seriously, okay, just go to my website to contentpolay.com. There we go. Read, right. read, read the piece that's out there. Okay, I go into great detail around what went on with Wagner and the history and so forth. Please, guys, just go ahead and uh, go check it out. And then, by all means, okay. you know, attack me on Twitter. <laughs> Good. That's the, that's the game we play. Attack him on Twitter. All right, everybody. Have an excellent day. We'll see you tomorrow.